are still in worship. It's just a different form. And I know, and I, hey, I'm right there with you. I go into information mode. Does anyone know information mode? When we kind of settle in and we go, this is what I'm asking you to do this morning. Do not turn off your engaging with the Lord in the process of receiving what the Lord wants to say to you this morning. Keep engaging him. It's not just information that we're looking for. It's transformation that we're looking for. And transformation happens not when this information hits our mind, but when the information gets into our spirit man. So let's engage him. Let's continue. He's so good. He's not just good. He's good, good. He's very good. So good. And he's holy. You know how I know he's holy? It's in his name. Holy Spirit, he's holy. Uh, just quick review. Last week we talked about the Holy Spirit being the agent of renewal. Uh, he renews our soul and is the means by which our spirit is brought alive. He applies what Jesus has done. Faith in Jesus, the washing of rebirth is by the blood of Jesus, our faith in it, and renewal by the Holy Spirit. He renews us. He is the means by which we live holy. He is it. We have been called and made holy positionally, and we are living out holiness because the Holy Spirit is working his fruit into us so that we look like Jesus. Does this make sense to everyone? If it does, let me hear amen. amen. There we go. That's awesome. He's holy. Look at this. One of the means by which we live holy. Romans 8, verse 12 through 14. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit, capital S, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. How do we overcome sinful nature? We talked about it last week. One, we, we crucify it. We're meant to do that daily. We die daily. But here's a couple of other re ways that we do this in following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And I said last week, humble yourself and yield to him. Humble yourself and yield. Submit and pursue God. Where have I heard this before? Oh, James chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. This is what it says. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. There is a level of formula in this. It's understanding this. Walk in humility before the Lord. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly before your God. Humble yourself. Yield. Submit. Pursue the Lord. This is part of the process of following the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then here's one that I didn't say last week. Learn to talk to yourselves. Remember the, the back in the 80s, it was like, don't talk to yourself. If you talk to yourself, people are going to think you're crazy. That was before cell phones and Bluetooth. And now we all look like we're nuts in the car. That guy's, oh, no, Bluetooth, Bluetooth. Learn to talk to yourself. What do I mean by that? Follow the example of King David. Example, example of King David. Still got to slow down just a little bit, just a little bit. Follow the example of King David. When we read scripture, we think that he's just making a proclamation. Bless the Lord, O oh my, and all that is within me, bless his. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget all of his benefits. He's not just declaring and making a proclamation. He's speaking to himself. And he's saying, line yourself up with what God wants to do. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. All that is within me, I command you. This is the spirit man talking to the soul realm saying, do what I tell you to do. I'm not going to submit to you. Mind, will, and emotions. That is comprised. I'll try to. 
mind, will, and emotions. That is what is comprised of our soul. And his spirit is rising up and saying, put your hope in God. Do not trust in the arm of the flesh. Put your trust and your hope in God. He is telling himself, do this. You're crazy if you don't talk to yourself. You need to learn to instruct the areas of you that are waiting for redemption to line up with that part of you that is redeemed and communicates with the Lord. This is what, learn to talk to yourself. I'm telling you, just say whatever you want to say, that's fine. It's not fine, but it's okay. It's not okay, but we'll get there. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Okay. So anyway, try this. You're struggling with sin. Rather than sitting there passively, speak to yourself. I will not do this in Jesus' name. See what happens. See what happens. Command your soul in that, because listen, sin is happening in the soul realm. Your mind is contemplating it. Your will wants to do it. And your emotions are saying it will make you feel good. Right? So you speak to those areas of you and you do it out loud. And don't be passive. Be confident. And you say, I will not participate with what my flesh is saying that I want to do. Because I say I don't want this. I want him. I don't want what the enemy is offering to me that looks like choice, amazing fruit. I want his fruit. I want the Holy Spirit to birth in me everything that Jesus paid for me to have. And I say no to it. Learn to talk to yourself. You yell at yourself. You're like, but I like myself. Yeah, you like you, but you don't like sometimes what you do. So speak to those areas and say, line up. Line up with what God wants to do. Another way, get to know the person of the Holy Spirit. Get to know the person of the Holy Spirit. I'll say this and I'll say it early because I might run out of time and I don't want to. Just think about this. Jesus says, my sheep know my. Do we know the voice of the one that Jesus says, it's better and better for me to go away so that he can come. Let me say it again. Jesus says, my sheep know my. And then Jesus also said, it is better that I go away, that he comes so that he can do his ministry with you. Do we know his voice to the same level? Do we know his voice to the same level? We need to learn to grow to know the person of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Walk in his ways. Talk with him. Build your relationship with him. And then lastly, follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to follow, that means that he's in the? He's in the driver's seat. He's the one that's steering the ship. All of the different examples that you can give, follow his leadership. Let me talk to you about the leadership of the Holy Spirit today. Number one, just for clarification, the Holy Spirit is the one who leads us, guides us in the New Testament era. He is the leader. For three plus years, three and a half years, however long, in that three plus years, Jesus walked with his followers on the earth being their rabbi. Rabbi simply means teacher, right? He taught them teaching and leading them the ways of God, setting the example of them. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14, verse 26, that the Holy Spirit would do for us? He will teach us all things and remind us of everything that Jesus has said. What Jesus is saying is, I have occupied the position of rabbi for you while I have been with you on the earth. Now that I am leaving to go back to heaven to complete the circle of what I started, I am sending to you another rabbi that is going to be with you forever. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And he will teach you 
all things. And he will, in my absence, you have him. It's an exchange that has taken place. And I find it always just, I don't know, there's a development and there's, but it's interesting that, of course, good night. We honor Jesus. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. We honor him. But we don't necessarily honor the Holy Spirit to the same level as we honor Jesus. Now, let's just face it. Jesus died for me. Holy Spirit didn't die for me. So much respect. Right? Absolutely 100%. But the Holy Spirit is still God. And he's the one who's been with us for 2,000 years. And we need to show him. Why do you think? Because I think that, I think, well, I know. God being brilliant and omniscient and knowing everything, he gave this principle to us. Any word that is spoken against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit, no forgiveness will be granted to him. And it's not only because he's holy, and that, but he understands, you have seen me walk on the earth as a physical man. When the Holy Spirit comes... He is a spirit that lives inside of you. You don't relate to him in the same way that you relate to a human being. Therefore, you need to learn to reverence and awe and respect him to a higher level. So anything that you speak against him will be held accountable to you. And you will not be forgiven of it. Jesus is pushing up, lifting up, magnifying the person of the Holy Spirit so that we will grow in our respect and honor of who he is and his role. Now, I want you to think about this, okay? I quoted this already, actually, and in, in, I believe it's uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Trust in thee with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your, and he will direct your path, correct? Right. And then we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It says, now the Lord is the, ooh, wait a minute. The Lord is the, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty, whatever your version says. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The Lord is the spirit. People, we need to grow in our trust of the leadership of, of the Holy Spirit to the same degree and level that we trust in Jesus' ability to save us. Seriously, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The idea of what he's saying is, not only is Jesus Lord, but the Spirit of God is, and God the Father is, triune Godhead. It is amazing how many people I have talked to when dealing with the Holy Spirit that he is viewed lesser. God the Father, the Son, the forgotten God. A little lower, a little lower in the setting. That's not scripture. It's not the way it works. I saw, uh, it just happened to be, I was doing some research on our trip and I was doing some studying and and looking at different stuff, and I saw that Lifeway had done a survey looking at how people, like Christians, of Christians, and their view of the Holy Spirit. And 56% of the people that they had uh, polled in their question viewed the Holy Spirit as a force or a power alone. 56%. For those of you who aren't necessarily the math wizards, that's over half. <laughs> over half of the people po polled said, no, he's a force. He's, he's a if you just view the Holy Spirit as a force or as power, then you really haven't built relationship with him. We need to grow in relationship with him, to trust him. How do you trust someone you don't have relationship with? I think that's one of the reasons we have so many questions about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's because we haven't focused on getting to know Him, getting to know all about Him. Getting to know, okay. <laughs> you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. <laughs> the 
Holy Spirit holds the position of leadership in our lives. Romans 8, verse 14 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Sons of God, that, 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 that shows me that, in other words, a mark of the people of God is that they follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So how do we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, number one, through the Word of God. Through this Word, God speaks to us. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. This Word right here is inspired by the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. That word God-breathed is pneuma. That word pneuma is... Spirit, the words of this book are inspired by the Holy Spirit. The authority and power that this book gets it, that holds it, is because the Holy Spirit inspired it. The, and, and this always offends people, so brace yourself. But the triune Godhead is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. I love you. Let me explain what I mean. The authority that this book gets is from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives this scripture, this is the revelation and the standard of God. If you want to know who God is, you turn to this book. And the reason that this book holds that weight and authority is because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so many times we use this book to chop off his hands from doing what he wants to do. And he's the one who inspired it to begin with. Just saying. Thank you, honey. I know you love me. I know. I know. I would say I have a ring to prove it, but it's not on my finger this morning, so I'm, I'm sorry. Leadership. Following. How does he lead us? Through the word of God. Now, there are two different ways that I see from the Word of God, that we, we fall into the leadership of the Holy Spirit. One is that we have what is called the Logos, the written contextual Word of God. That is God's Word in context, meaning that when this Scripture was written, it had an original, it had an original audience in mind with circumstances that surrounded the writing of this, of where it was inspired, that we have to dig out the truth to find out, okay, Holy Spirit, what did you intend when you first penned these words to the first audience that you penned them to so that we can accurately and appropriately apply what you wanted us to know into our lives today? This is one of the ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He helps us to know in context, what this word says. That's logos. That's God's word in context. And then there's also this thing called rhema. That's God's word in season. Logos, God's word in context. Rhema, God's word in season. And that is God is speaking a word to you in your circumstances at present right now that he is communicating to you so that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he's got his eye on you and he's talking to you. That can be from the word of God, and that can be him just communicating with you. By the way, he talks to us. I know you know that, but for the sake of saying. Sometimes in Ramah, God quickens a certain text of scripture to you to speak to you in your circumstance. Do you know that the Reformation happened because of a level of both Logos and Rhema with Martin Luther? Martin, if you don't know who Martin Luther is, he is the, the leader of the Protestant Reformation that happened in the 1500s. Martin Luther was trying to pay for his sins. And he was trying, he'd been taught, I, 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 gotta, I gotta do penance, I gotta work this off. And so literally, he would get down on his knees and he would walk up and down his stairs time and time again, saying, God, take the stain off my 
off of my spirit, man. Take this stain of sin away from me. I can tell it has not happened. How, what do I need to do? What do I need to do in working to be able to get this off of me? And it wasn't working because that's not how it's done. And so one night he went into his closet where he had a candle lit and he threw down his Bible and the Bible popped open to a specific chapter and a specific page. And he looked down on the page and when he saw it, his eyes fell directly to a scripture in Romans that said, the just shall live by faith. And he went, this is both logos and a word in season rhema for him. And he went, we live by faith. This was revelatory to them. We live by faith. That means we're forgiven by what Jesus did and our faith in him. And he came up with all the, I don't need to go down the whole, I will because I love theology, but we don't need to go down the whole road of that. But know this, in that moment he got a word from the Lord wanted to communicate to the world of going, okay, we've gotten into a works mentality. We need to get away from the works mentality and understand that what I did to you is a free gift for you to be saved and you accept it by faith in that moment. That's an example of how the Holy Spirit communicates to us, both in the Logos and in the Rhema. Here are other ways that he communicates to us. Just a couple. Promptings, nudges, speaking to our spirit, speaking to our mind. Some people audibly hear him. That's never been me. But people who have have told me it scared the fire out of them. He communicates with us. How many of you have ever had a prompting of the Holy Spirit where you knew that the Holy Spirit was communicating to you in that moment and he was saying, this is what I want you to do. Raise your hand. Look around the room. Look around the room. How many of you have ever had the nudge where you're going, I think God really wants me to do this. It's like the little elbow of get out there, get out there and go do it. Raise your hand. How many of you have ever had the Holy Spirit speak to your spirit man and you know that there was a word that came into you that it wasn't your brain talking to you, but it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you, giving you an instruction? Raise your hand. Look around the room. This is how he talks to us. Let me give you, let me give you some examples of how the Holy Spirit communicates to us scripturally. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. This is about as plain as you could possibly get. The Spirit told Philip. <laughs> Let us dig into the exegetical meat of this to find out what happened. What happened? The Spirit told Philip. We don't even have to read the rest. We know this is for the, we will. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. This is dealing with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Holy Spirit was directing him, leading him, spoke to him, and he knew that it was the voice of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another example. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 through 7. Paul and his companion, Paul and his companion, we'll edit that out later. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of the notes being messed up. Here we go. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Firga and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of that place, they tried to enter that other place, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. That's not verbal talking. That is a prompting of don't do this. Quite frankly, I find out a whole lot of times that the Holy Spirit has more red lights than he has green lights. We're often asking the Holy Spirit to do things that he has already commissioned us to do in his word. And we're waiting for the green light when he's going, I've already, I've already written that. I, I, I actually had like some dude back in the day where I was like, you need to write this for future generations. Penned it down. Stop waiting on me for this. You've already got it from me. And so we're always like, do I do, do I do this? Do I not do this? There's nothing wrong with asking for, for guidance in that instance. There's absolutely nothing wrong for that. But just know this. When Paul was on his missionary journeys, if he went here and it got a red light, 
he would just turn around and go here. It doesn't say he asked if whether or not he was go there. He went there, he'd get a red light. Then he'd turn around and go here, and I got a green light. Okay, we'll go here. All right. It's not to say there's never a green light. There are green light situations. There are. It's not to throw that under the baby out with the bathwater. There are green light situations. But boy, oh boy, let's just step out. Let's just step out. If he, if he doesn't want us to do it, Bubba, he will let us know. He will let us know. And in this instance, in Acts 16, I believe he prompted those people and said, stop. This isn't the time for you to go. And he call, he's called the spirit of Jesus. Why? Because he's an evangelistic God. Paul is setting out to evangelize people. And the spirit of God literally arrested him and said, not right now. Let's go over here because the time for them to be ripe is to happen. And led them in a different direction. Here's the deal, though. There was always momentum and movement to spread the message of Jesus. We don't have to ask if we should evangelize. We already know we should. And quite frankly, we're empowered to evangelize, and that's one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us. So what we need to do is step out. And if, he's, if he thinks we're going down a wrong path or going to a place that we shouldn't go, he'll go, nope, not there. Turn and go to this other place. But it's all dependent. It's already in motion. It's already in motion. That's how he leads. And just for all of you to be on the same page with me in this, we balance everything that we hear, everything that we feel, everything that we discern and experience off of this book right here. We look. We don't just go willy-nilly with these things. This is the revelation of the Holy Spirit for us to be able to see how God acts. This is a revelation of the Holy Spirit to see how he does, who he is. And so we balance the experiences that we have. We balance the messages that we receive. We balance the feelings that we have, the promptings and nudges, all off of this word right here. Because this is the, the, one of the major guides that we have in the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if you ever feel like something is taking you in a direction that does not line up with God, question that spirit. If you ever uh, have something that is prompting you that goes different than what the Word of God has to say, question that. But also understand, just because you don't know what's in there doesn't mean it's not in there. Ask people who might know. Seek out people who might be a little farther along the road than you. Find examples of what's going on inside of Scripture. Oh, my goodness. I'll wrap up with this. Being led by the Holy Spirit requires we follow his lead, which requires yielding, submitting, getting to know him, and giving up levels of control. Did you feel it? <laughs> giving up levels of control. Let me give you an example of a control issue. It's so funny. Tom prayed for me this morning and used this scripture. Uh, let me give you an example, just a quick one. Uh, Jesus promises in John chapter 7, verse 38 through 39, he promises this. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, isn't that interesting? That Jesus references the scripture as his point to prove that what he's about to say is true. He who, that's the way it's done. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. The river of living water that is to come out of us is the, it's the spirit. I heard a person teach once. <laughs> I heard a person teach once, and sorry, I think it's, it's funny. It's not funny, but it's funny. heard someone teach. He said, you know, Jesus said that rivers of living water will flow out of us. But you know what rivers need? Rivers need guardrails. Rivers need guardrails because if a river just comes out and starts flowing willy-nilly everywhere, it will destroy everything that it flows over and needs to have guardrails and channels in order to and I know he didn't realize it, but he just said the Holy Spirit's going to destroy the world. 
I know he didn't realize this, like he, he hadn't thought it through, but he, it's like all of a sudden it's like, oh my goodness, the Holy Spirit's going to kill us all. What's happening? That's insane. What we are saying is that we have to have levels of control on the person of God to determine whether or not he's going to be successful with what he wants to do. That doesn't make any sense at all. And what that, that's, I just want to give you an example of where we have control issues and we don't even realize we have control issues. We've got to put up guardrails. We've got to protect ourselves from the one that Jesus said it was better for him to be here with us than him to be here. And we've got to make sure that he does things the way that we want. Ooh. Ooh. The way that we want him. I don't feel comfortable with that. Does it match up with the scriptures? What's my point in all this? If you know the person of the Holy Spirit, if you've built a relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, you don't ever have to think about guardrails because you know that he is your guard. If you know the person of the Holy Spirit and you've built relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit, you know that he is the most trustworthy agent that's on the earth. Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than the brother. And the Holy Spirit is a helper that does a great job like a spouse does. And you go, what do you mean? Parakletos, it's the same word. It's the same word that's used for Eve that's used for the Holy Spirit. Don't go around saying, I said the Holy Spirit's our wife. That's not what I said. <laughs> that's not what I'm implying either. I'm saying that we are in covenant relationship with him, and he, he is faithful, faithful and trustworthy and true. And does more for us than we probably will ever know until we get to glory. And we're in our glorified bodies and we look back and we go, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that you had done all of this for me. Because he's worthy. Let's grow in our trust of him. Let's grow to know him better. Stand to your feet if you would.